If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. This is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm joined by my uh, associate in this ministry, our Director of Research, Steve Morrison. Great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Larry. And uh, our viewers may be familiar with the fact that uh, we've been showing a series on a topic, the topic being the Muslim religion, the Muslim religion of Islam, and this is show number four in the series that we're currently conducting. Steve has done a lot of extensive research in this, this field and we're going to discuss this in detail. Our first uh, three programs are behind us and we covered various aspects of the Quran, the origins of Islam, uh, a lot of the uh, teachings of the Al-Bakari Hadith, which uh, Sunni Muslims hold in especially high uh, regard and today we're going to be discussing uh, uh, answering Muslim questions on Christianity. We uh, will be uh, trying to answer a lot of the arguments that Muslims bring up regarding this and uh, hopefully they'll be a benefit to our viewers whether uh, Muslim or Christian from whichever persuasion and uh, I think worthy of your time and effort. Now if you uh, need further information as we talk and dialogue, you have questions, you're free to uh, call us when the phone numbers uh, show up or write us uh, at our address at the end of the show. We have newsletters, we have tracts and literature on Islam, other subjects and topics, free upon request. So feel free to call us there. Now, generally in this series, we've been doing a review of what we've covered in the past, but uh, my brother Steve here was telling me that we got a lot of material in this particular show, and so if you're interested in the origins, origins of Islam, uh, you know, the Quran or the Islamic Hadith, try to uh, contact us for those previous shows, get an audio soundtrack or a video of that, or ask the cable company to replay those shows. We simply don't have time in this broadcast to get into that today. We're, we're dealing with another subject along the, the, uh, this whole question uh, of Islam, but of course, the title of our Islamic series is called Can the Muslim Religion Send Someone to Hell? Like I said, this is part four, and we're trying to answer that question from detailed information dealing with the uh, actual teachings and the authoritative sources of Islam. Can the Muslim Religion Send Someone to Hell? We're trying to answer that and find out what the answer is and uh, we've been answering that question, I think, almost every single broadcast, and we'll do the same thing in this one. So stay tuned and listen carefully and hear what we have to say. And we thank any Muslim viewers that are joining us today to uh, uh, stay with us. And uh, if you have questions or other comments you'd like to make, please call and uh, let us hear your views. We're, we're open to what you have to say. Okay, Steve, with that, uh, as our opening comments, we're going to go right to a chart that the viewers at home are looking at right now. And this is an overview of what this particular show is going to cover. The Bible and other books, Jesus, religious experience and practice, accepting Jesus, Christianity, Bible versus explained. Okay, so that's a, that's a synopsis of our, our whole program. Now, we're going to look at this Bible verse to set up the whole show here. It's 1 John 5, 12 through 13 from the New International Version. Steve, did you want to read that? Or? Okay. Uh, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's right. So we're going to get into these things. 
So you will know one way or the other if you have eternal life by knowing the Son of God, which is Christ Jesus according to the Bible. Now, the Quran says something different, but we can discuss all this as we get into our, our program. So, talking about the Bible and this verse that Steve just quoted from, let's go to our, our first chart here in this sequence. And you'll see on your screen it says the Bible. And uh, we have several points here, and I'm going to let my colleague Steve start explaining to the viewers what they're seeing and what he'd like to comment on. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what, uh, one of, to me, one of the key questions that Muslims ask Christians is basically along the lines of, hasn't the Bible been corrupted? Okay, because Islam rests upon the fact of saying the Bible was from God, but the explanation of why the Quran is so different than the Bible and basically preaches a different message is because the Bible has been corrupted. If the Bible stands then uh, as reliably preserved, then Islam falls today. Okay. Now there's kind of a two-part answer. One is that if the Bible had been changed, like let's say it was changed in the Middle Ages or changed some other time, then what we could do is that we could simply change it back. As far as the Old Testament goes, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls written from the time of Christ and before, and so we know what the Old Testament said in Jesus' time. Okay? And if Jesus had been given the Torah, like the Quran says, and we know the Torah that he was given. The second thing is on the New Testament, we have manuscripts, we have a, uh, a part of Luke going back to 100 AD, and we have uh, the John Ryland's uh, papyri fragment of the Gospel of John going back to 125 AD. You know, 125, you know, meaning roughly maybe 115 to 130 AD. About 100 years from the actual writing. Uh, let, yeah. It, it, uh, we don't know exactly when it was written, but 100 years for, from, from Jesus, you know, crucifixion. And that still puts it 500 years or so before Muhammad right. and the Quran. And, 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 and we have, you know, the complete text of the entire Bible from long before Muhammad. And if Christians are told to look in their books and to judge what, you know, what the Quran says in Muhammad's time, then the Christians had to have something, you know, to, to judge by. Now there's evidence for this manuscript of the, the scripture like you're talking about and these references to the Torah and things uh, from all around the globe basically from mm -hmm. different countries, different places they right. have evidence, the Dead Sea Scrolls, things of this nature. Uh, when, and, and now the other half is that look, comparing the preservation of the Bible to the preservation of the Quran the Quran, even in Moses, I mean, in, even in Muhammad's time, had verses that were abrogated or taken out, and that's even substantiated by Islamic teaching. Yes, which we in covered in a previous program. Right, and 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 in addition to that, there are variations uh, in content in the Quran, not just dialect differences, but content, and they aren't variations on major doctrines, uh, but but there are variations there, so. The Bible, you know, ha has not been corrupted. Yes, there have been some copyist errors and, and, and some uh, number of variant readings, but they don't affect the basic message. Okay, and you could, if you're going to look at those small things and say, oh, that shows changes, the Quran has changes also. And in fact, many changes, which we'll get into in another program. Right. But uh, the, the point being, if you attack the Bible based on little copyist errors or things of this nature and say well it's all corrupted well then if you uh, apply that same criteria to the Quran right well then you've got an infinite number of problems there and then yeah, you suddenly right. can't believe what the Quran says right and, and one of the four collectors of, of, of the Quran there were three surahs that were missing for example mm -hmm. you know? alright well this leads into our next question is why is there uncertainty in Bible verses? All right, first of all, let's talk about some of the un uncertainty. In the New Testament, uh, we are uh, basically certain of every single word on a word-by-word -word basis of 97 or 97 and a half percent of all the words in the New Testament. Now, why were there changes? Well, there were some copyist errors. Sometimes a word was left out. Uh, sometimes uh, they did things to like smooth the Greek uh, grammar. The grammar, of course, changed, uh, you know, hundreds of years after Christ slightly. And so there was some of that. There were places to where there were uh, some phrases um, that, that, that were in one and not in the other. And we can look at that and we can analyze that. Do you think that that is a more credible way or is a more credible way to just take one copy of the Bible and order all the others burned? Because that's exactly what happened with the Quran, in that Uthman ordered all copies of the Quran burned except for his standardized version. And that's substantiated from Islamic sources. Right. 
Now a few weren't burned and did survive and we can see those and see some of the differences. So you can have it out on display in, uh, in, in some museums. Right. And, and, and I used to even commented on how many verses were in, in a surah in the Quran and that's not the number of verses at all that's in there today. Okay. Uh, the, another question related is not given a particular book in the Bible, uh, is it correct today, but do we have the right books? Do, maybe do we have other stuff? Okay, well, we know we have the right books for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, God's promise. God promised that he would preserve his word in Isaiah 55, 11, 59, 21, and also you can see that in 1 Peter 1, 23 to 24. And if we look right now in, in, in Isaiah 55, And while he's turning that page, I'd like to say to the viewers, there are many multitudes of scripture where it talks about God preserving his word, looking over his word. The, his word is a hammer to smash lies and falsehoods. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 29, so forth. They, uh, God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. The scripture talks about uh, God's word uh, is is shown by the writers themselves to be the word of God and God is using that word to discern the intents and thoughts of the heart. It's incredible how many, we go ahead brother, you finally okay. you get the verse here, right? Alright, so uh, God is speaking here through Isaiah and he's saying starting in verse 10, well, um, it, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is the word that goes out from my mouth. Uh, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Okay, so that God has shown that his word does not come back void, but his word does what he accomplishes. Looking at Isaiah 59, 21, uh, God's making this promise. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you and my words that I have put in your mouth Will not depart from your children. Uh, will not depart from the mouths of your children, or from the mouths of their descendants, from this time on and forever, says the Lord. And so God is saying that His word on earth will not depart from His descendants. Okay, so that's one way we know that that that, uh, that God, the Bible has a protect correct books and God's word is preserved. Another way that we know is that Jesus um, verified the correct books of the Old Testament, that is, uh, because he referred to the uh, Psalm, uh, he referred to the writings and, 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 and to the Torah, and he gave evidence that he believed in all of the books that the Jews in Palestine believed in. And the, the Jewish Old Testament is the same as the Protestant Old Testament today. They have a few books split up in different order, I mean split up the we may have combined in a different order, but the, but the books and the content is the same. I would like to say too, just uh, as a correction a minute ago, I think I said J Jeremiah 29, 23, but it should be Jeremiah 23, 29. Okay. God's hammer is his word. Uh, you have the many passages of scripture that uh, talk about uh, in Matthew 15, 9, 3 through 9, it says, And thus you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. He talks about the word of God being what you can put your teeth into what you can trust and men come up with man-made traditions mm -hmm. and other things that would go against it but uh, as many scriptures too many I can I can quote here uh, say show that it is the Word of God and, and if I could just for a minute to interrupt you Steve sure. I wanted to mention that uh, there are some facts and evidences and I've used this on a lot of our programs but mm -hmm. I always love going through this this uh, litany of, uh, of, of references here it, the Genesis chapter 1 for instance states God said nine times. Uh, Malachi says, thus, says the Lord, thus says the Lord 23 times. 23 times he says that. The Lord spoke appears 560 times in the first five books of the Bible. Isaiah claimed his message came directly from God 40 times. Ezekiel claimed it came directly from God 60 times. Uh, Jeremiah claimed he got his word from God a hundred times. Uh, you know, at least 3,800 times in the Old Testament, the, the quote, the Lord spoke, end quote, appears. It's like, how many times do the prophets of the Old Testament and then Jesus in the New Testament have to say, the Lord said, mm -hmm. thus the Lord spoke, the Lord says. And it's over and over and over again throughout the scripture. Now when you, you follow the ministry of Jesus, he's always talking about, does not Moses say this? And he talks about 
Noah and he talks about Adam and he talks about different characters that are mentioned in the Old Testament because as you mentioned already he had a Torah he had the the books that we have even to this day due to things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and so forth the evidence is just overwhelming in this case right and and, and saying we have the correct books in the Old Testament shouldn't be a big problem for Muslims because even in the Quran it mentions about Moses and the Torah it mentions Isaiah it mentions Ezekiel David right. Solomon uh, 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 P Jonah, people like that. So, so um, it, 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 it's basically, you know, they, they should have no problem with that. Now in the New Testament, uh, it meant, the Quran mentions the apostles, it doesn't say too much about them besides that and they follow Jesus, but we have the testimony of the early Christians who learned from him and from the apostles that Jesus selected um, to show that we have the right books. And we have the faith that God preserved his word and that he, pre he preserved it in the, in the church. And we have all kinds of quotes of people who are like disciples of the Apostle John. Mm -hmm. So I guess the long and the short of it here then, brother, is that uh, there's plenty of manuscript evidence. There's church history where you can recreate the Bible just from the writings of people quoting the Bible mm -hmm. that go all the way back in time. Uh, this is indisputable evidence. And to, as we mentioned before, to jump and say, well, there... This verse wasn't an earlier translation. I've heard some Muslim apologists argue that, well, at the end of uh, Mark chapter 16, there's some verses there that aren't found in other manuscripts, and so mm -hmm. they were added and stuff like this. But uh, where, where you have that is just like 3% of the time, and it doesn't affect any major doctrine, and we know where that is. But 97% of the, the o text over right, yeah. is, is accurate and verifiable by manuscript evidence going all the way back before Muhammad's time. Right. And this can't be touched by the Muslims. So when they say it's corrupted, they really don't have a, a, a historical fact to stand on, mm -hmm. it seems like. Okay, now we got another chart coming up here, brother. And this one's on other books. Okay. Let's say, well, why don't Christians accept the Quran since it mentions Jesus? Well, just because the book mentioned Jesus, many people, even in the 19th, 20th century, have made up books that mention Jesus and don't have the, uh, don't talk about the, the, you know, Jesus the correct way. And in the Islamic world, there are over two, a couple of hundred thousand hadiths about uh, Muhammad, and many of those are spurious and fake, and, and Muslims recognize that too. So mentioning Jesus is isn't enough. It has to be. Is it really the same thing? Is it is it really the well, same message? Well, you can use the example like the Book of Mormon, for instance. Yeah. So, they, uh, 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 as far as I know, uh, Orthodox Muslims do not recognize the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, the Mormon Church, as being an authentic. Uh, church or organization that's following the true and living God. Right, 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 because Mormons believe that, you know, Mormon men who do the right things can become like God is now, but, but, but and Christians and Muslims agree that that's wrong. The Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, all these Mormon books, they all, they all mention Jesus. Mm -hmm. They talk about Jesus. So that, doesn't that make that authentic? Make, make the book authentic? No, it's like you're just talking about. Or I, I wish I had remembered because I've got quite an extensive uh, comparative religion library at home, but I've got a, I've got a book about that thick. It's called a Urantia book. Mm -hmm. It was translated as supposedly by aliens from space <laughs> who are giving us or filling in the life of Jesus during the missing years between the age of 12 and when he started his earthly ministry, uh, about the age of 30, I, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Urantia book, it's telling us all about Jesus and and what he did and some of the stuff he, you know, his life and, and things, but I don't know of any Muslim that recognizes the Urantia book, which is supposed to be a book telling us about Jesus right. transmitted by extraterrestrials. Right. I, I, and no Muslim should. No Christian should either. So, so the point of the matter is, just because the Quran talks about Jesus, or the book of Urantia talks about Jesus, or the Book of Mormon talks about Jesus, it doesn't necessarily mean you're talking about the same Jesus is we find authenticated in the church history and the manuscript evidence mm -hmm. that we already discussed. Right. Now, a, a related question to that, that some Muslims might ask if they're knowledgeable about, oh, I guess some issues in Muslim is, why don't Christians accept the Gospel of Barnabas? Or why should the Gospel of Barnabas be in the Bible? And we will have a whole section discussing that later. But the Gospel of Barnabas uh, was, was basically a forgery of a Gospel. Uh, the original language, from what we can tell, is Italian not Arabic, not Hebrew, not Greek, not anything else. And, 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 and while it does say things like, um, 
uh, you know, Muhammad will be the messenger uh, and things like that. It also says things that uh, contradict the Bible as well as contradict the Quran as well as things that weren't true at all until the Middle Ages. And so it's pretty clearly a, a, a forgery. So just like people made up hadiths about Muhammad that are just pretend, people made up books about Jesus that are just pretend too. And just if it says Jesus doesn't, you know, necessarily prove it. And, and there's just a lot of reasons why it didn't make it. Not only the doctrinal content, but mm -hmm. like you're saying, the uh, uh, the historical content doesn't match up with the times. Uh, there's just a lot of evidence which we'll get into later that disqualifies it. Right. And and and, and as to what about other books? Uh, there are other books that were just made up by unbelievers about Jesus. Uh, there were some religious books, though, written by good Christians. Uh, one of my favorite, for example, is uh, 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 First Clement, written 97, 98 A.D., probably written by somebody who heard Paul the Apostle. Well, it's a pretty good book. It only has maybe a couple things wrong in it, and they're not that major, but Clement was not an eyewitness, and so it was not accepted by the church as scripture. Uh, it's a good book, just like, you know, various people write good books today, but it, 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 it wasn't by an, an eyewitness or, or someone who was a translator. Yeah, it wasn't considered to be the inspired word of God, which is flawless, right? because there were mistakes, and they saw the mistakes, and that's why they disqualified it, and it wasn't an eyewitness, like you said. Right, and it doesn't mean it's a, it's a bad book. But anyway, moving on uh, the, uh, to the next section is uh, Muslims have a lot of questions, I guess, about the the Christian under, the Christian view of Jesus. And it says, since God or Allah does not have a physical body, how can Jesus be the Son of God? And let me try to explain this in in terms that maybe mu Muslims could relate to. Okay, um, be, say, when we say Jesus is the Son of God. We do not mean that God had any sexual relationship or in a crude physical sense. Okay? It is an expression of deep significance showing the close relationship uh, that Jesus had even before time began of uh, being uh, begotten of the Father. Okay? Also, of course, he was born of, the, born of the Virgin Mary, and she was a virgin when, uh, uh, when he was born. But uh, the, the only male, I guess, in, you know, part was mirac miraculously by God. Okay, not in a, in, 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 a, in a physical way. All right, now there's a sort of a parallel in Islam, a couple of them, is that in Shiite Muslims, they call Ali the finger of God. Okay, also in Bukhari Hadith, volume 9, number 543 for Sunnis, that also mentions Ali as the finger of God. Now, Muslims, when they say this, they are not saying that God has fingers, or maybe he has only nine fingers because Ali was the tenth one, and you know, he, something happened there. They're not saying that at all. What they mean is, is that this is a symbolic expression. Okay, so when we say Jesus is the Son of God, it's a, it's a symbolic expression also. Also in one of the Hadiths, I don't have it here, it says, Allah disdains not to use the similitude of things. So Allah, you know, can use, you know, symbolic expressions, Muslims would say, and, and, and we, we would a agree with. Also as far as how can Jesus be begotten of the Father and yet not be created, well, in, in Islam, many Muslims believe that the Quran was never created. And yet the Quran, uh, th there was never a time at which it was created. And yet the Quran came from Allah. And so if they can believe that about the Quran, that it was e eternal and yet uh, not created at any point in time, we believe the same about, you know, Jesus, God the Son. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, uh, and we kind of answer number two. If Jesus is not a created being, how is he begotten of God? Uh, and number three, if there's only one God, which we agree there's only one God, how can Jesus be God, and how can the Trinity be true? Okay, well, before we can answer this question, we need to say in a simple manner, uh, what is the Trinity? All right, the Trinity says there is one inseparable God. Okay, to talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three gods, that is not the Trinity, that is not the Bible. The other part, so it's one inseparable God, but there are three distinct persons, not separate, but distinct persons inside the God. Uh, a part of God. They are the same in nature and, and honor. You're supposed to honor the Son as you honor the Father, as Jesus said um, in, in John 5. But they differ in role and rank. It was the Son who died on the cross, not the Father. It was the Son who learned submission. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it was the Son on earth who, who obeyed the Father. The, a Trinitarian Christian, and the Trinity is what the Bible teaches clearly, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. But it, the Bible clearly says there's only one God, not three gods, one God, you get that in Isaiah 43.10, 44.6, 45, verses 5 and 6, uh, verses 14, 18, 21 through 23. All that's in Isaiah 45. And then uh, 1 uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse 16. 
Also, you get uh, the Father is God. The Scripture clearly states, and almost everybody agrees with that. In John chapter five, verse eighteen; Romans fifteen six; Second Corinthians one and two; and Galatians one one. Uh, Jesus is God. The Scripture te teaches that over and over again. This is a major sticking point with our Muslim friends, mm. uh, but the, the Bible clearly talks about it. And this is why they always say the Bible's distorted, but the Scripture says, for, for, for instance, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, Hebrews 1, 8, Titus 2, 13, John 20, 28, 1 Timothy 3, 16. And there's many other passages, but those there clearly state Jesus is God in the flesh. John 1, 1, for instance, as well, uh, in verse 14. The Holy Spirit is God, the Scripture says, in Acts 5, 3, and 4, Acts 13, 2 through 4, Acts 15, 28, Acts 28, 25, and John 14, verses 16 and 26, although uh, our Muslim friends would say in, in John 14 there that that's talking about Muhammad, mm -hmm. not the Holy Spirit being God, but you have the scripture references there. And of course, the other thing is the distinction of persons. Uh, these three are the one God, not, uh, but they're not, they're st within the nature of the one God, there are three eternally distinct persons. The distinction, in other words, Jesus is not the Father, the Father is not the Son, Jesus is not the Holy Spirit and so forth. And you get scriptures like Matthew 3, 16 through 17, Luke 3, 21 through 22, John 1, 1 again, John 17, 5, John 8, verses 17 and 18. These are, these are some key scripture verses to show you that the Bible does indeed teach the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, go ahead, brother. I just had to get that in. Okay, all right. It has to be put in somewhere, and I figured that was the time hmm. to do it. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, moving on, the other kind of general topic is just kind of uh, illustrating some differences between experience, inexperience and practice. Uh, for example, how do Christians pray? Um, that's something that probably needs some discussion. I was having a Bible study one time with, with a, a, a Muslim from Turkey, and at the end, I prayed, and, and at the end, he looked at me kind of funny, and he said, it didn't sound like that prayer was written down anywhere. And I said, well, actually it wasn't. I mean, I prayed what was on my heart. And he said, oh, well, when we pray, uh, we usually, you know, pray certain written down prayers. And, and it's like, you know, well, they're not alone. Some of the Jews did that too. And, you know, they would only pray prescribed prayers. And prayer was like a ritual versus a relationship. Can you imagine talking to my children or talking to my father on earth or, or, or mother on earth and just saying certain prescribed things and never really having a relationship and telling them how I feel? And you know, I, I was able I was able to share with him that um, you know prayer. You know, what do you do? You know, for just general talking to God. You know, that's really what prayer is. Okay. In contrast to that, let's look at some of the major Islamic emphases. And I get this information, uh, this particular information, not from talking to Muslims, but from just kind of statistically looking at the number of pages uh, in, let's say, the Bukhari Hadith and Fiqh Sunnah on different topics. So. Uh, as I count it, there in what I, in what I have the Bukhari Hadith, there are about uh, 4,705 pages, and it's like Arabic on one half and English on the other half, and about 11% of all those pages talk about jihad or holy war. So that's kind of a major emphasis there. About 8% is on rules for prayer, the time that you can pray, the times that you can't pray, you're not supposed to talk to God. Okay, and then about 35% of the 764 pages of the Fiqh Usuna are rules for prayer. And about 85% of that is all the mechanics of prayer. So the Muslims are really concerned uh, with the mechanics and outward things. Um, Sufi Muslims actually would probably disagree with that, but Muslims as a whole, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the other sects are, are, are very concerned with that. Okay, now the thing, how do genuine Christian morals compare with morals in the Quran and, and Hadith? We've talked about that in uh, a, a, a previous uh, episode in the series, but basically Muslim, uh, the basic things change a lot when you talk about revenge, loving enemies, uh, having sex with captive women, uh, war, uh, uh, fighting other people. Uh, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace for a reason and we need to pay attention to that. Okay, the other question which is fairly common is why don't Christians follow the Old Testament dietary laws? And my question back is do you think Muslims do? Okay. Uh, there, there are many dietary laws that the Jews had. Uh, for example, no pork and no camel meat. Well, Muslims, Muhammad taught that it was okay to eat camel meat. 
Okay, and now if you had talked to a Muslim, they would probably say that the old verse was ab abrogated or it was superseded by Muhammad's teaching. Well, we as Christians uh, show that uh, in both Acts and Jesus himself and Mark, that Jesus pronounced all things were clean. And so we don't say that that teaching was the teaching was right for that time, but Jesus uh, specifically superseded that teaching. Okay, but you know, if you thought we were supposed to follow Old Testament laws, well, you know, you want you know, Muslims don't follow them either. Okay, and then you have your references there on the chart from the Bible, okay, that verify what you're saying. And Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16, is uh, particularly significant to this question, right? Because an angel is telling Peter, Arise, kill, and eat. He's, uh, uh, animals are unclean in the Old Testament and Peter's protesting and the angel is telling him you know you need you basically you need to obey you know obey God and do that and also a Matthew 15 uh, verse 11 and 17 to 18 and Mark chapter 7 verse 14 to 15 are other New Testament verses that show that okay all right now as we get into this next chart which is about accepting Jesus uh, what I find interesting here and we've talked about it just briefly in the other programs we've done so far in the series but I've stated already in the, in the past that Islam is a religion of disbelief. Now, I know that sounds weird. It's, it's a religion of disbelief and unbelief because where they're disbelieving and unbelieving is when it comes to anything the Bible says that's different than what the Quran or Muhammad might have said in the Hadith. So Muslims automatically disbelieve Jesus have an unbelief in Jesus or the things of the Bible uh, built into them from their tradition and their Islamic teachings. So Islam is basically a denial of the things taught by Jesus and his disciples. It's a, a system, an organized system of unbelief when it comes to the things of God in the Bible. So uh, we can quote all these passages that Steve just mentioned here. And if it doesn't jive with something the Quran says, well, then it's just not believed or it's a corrupted verse or there's some excuse why we're not going to believe it. Now, when we come to this chart, accepting Jesus, keep that in mind. Accepting Jesus, one of the key things to it is Jesus said, you must believe. believe. The, 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 the disciples said, what must, uh, the jailer said, what must I do to be saved in, in Acts 16? And for 31, the apostles said, oh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy household. Mm -hmm. Belief. So uh, the problem with Islam is that we find over and over and over again, every time we, Christ, we as Christians try to share verses or Bible verses about accepting Jesus or, or biblical truth, the system of unbelief and disbelief by Islam immediately comes into play. Well, I, I just had to preface that as we go into this chart. Steve, take over. Accepting okay. Jesus. All right. Uh, can I get to heaven without accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior? All right, Acts 4.12 says, Salvation, NIV, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which you may be saved. Okay, but a Muslim would not believe that. Right. And because he, he automatically goes with the Quran, which says, no, you get saved a, a different way. Right. But regardless of what a Muslim believes, at least we want Muslims to know um, that this is part of the message of the Bible. And that if you ever wonder, well, does it really matter? You know, can you say, well, if I'm a good Muslim, I'll go to heaven. If I'm a good Christian, I'll go to heaven too. Okay, Peter said otherwise in Acts 4.12. Jesus said otherwise in John 14.6, which I think you, 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 you quoted before. And so uh, you have to choose one or the other. If the Bible is reliable and if there's no other way beside Jesus, then you better accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Well, what did Jesus say? I believe it was in Second Thessalonians chapter 1 that uh, he will come with all his holy angels in flaming fire to bring vengeance uh, on those who believe not the gospel. Right. Uh, you know, in, there. in everlasting punishment and all this type of stuff. But, of course, once again, the system of unbelief instilled by Islam just, just throws out things Jesus says in this regard. So in this chart you're looking at about accepting Jesus, do Muslims go to heaven if they do not believe Jesus is the Son of God? But Jesus very clearly says there. Well, what, you it, got the it, verse? You yeah. want to read it? Uh, Second Thessalonians, uh, Paul is actually speaking here. Uh, it, it says um, in verse 7 uh, in the middle, This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire 
with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Now that's pretty clear. They'll be punished. They won't accept the gospel. But uh, in Islam, their, their gospel is totally alien and different than the Christian gospel. Right. So obviously from a biblical Christian perspective based on the verse right there which is disbelieved and unbelieved mm -hmm. by Islam but if, if, if a Muslim viewer out there could just for a minute think maybe there is something to the Bible at least Muhammad thought so in the Quran it's, he's, he's giving lip service to the Bible and, and things of this nature and the Bible was here first before the Quran ever came along and we already told you about the manuscript evidence doesn't verify that the Bible's been corrupted like all these Muslim apologists are saying, if the Bible is indeed true, then the answer to this question on a chart mm -hmm. is obvious. Do Muslims go to heaven if they do not believe Jesus is the Son of God? The answer is a resounding no. They right. will not go to heaven. Right. Yeah. They will be destroyed. They will go to hell. Now, now, I should say that uh, many Muslims, they would say that the gospel that uh, Jesus originally said, they whatever it is, uh, that they would believe that. Uh, but they do not necessarily accept Paul's writings at, at, at well, right. scripture, See, but, it, but the church did. It's part, of the, it's part of that instilled gospel of unbelief of Islam. Mm. Anything that we don't already agree with, we're not going to accept. Right. So it's a preconceived assumption that, well, I'm right from my perspective, so anything the Bible says that I, that I don't agree with, I'm just not going to accept. Right. I'm not going to believe it. Uh, the Quran says Jesus was not cru crucified. We read all over the place in the Bible that Jesus was crucified. Yeah. Well, we'll throw all that out because yeah. I just don't believe it, and no it, matter what the evidence and facts say. And then Muslims might wonder why it appears like we do the same thing, except instead of having the word Paul, we put the word Muhammad in. Well, we have reason to believe that because what Muhammad spoke is not only inconsistent with what Paul said, but is inconsistent with what we have reliably preserved that Jesus said. Right. See, now this is a major problem for, and particularly for you uh, Muslim viewers out there. Just think for a minute. Muhammad is talking about Jesus, talking about people of the book, talking about the Jews and the Christians and things, and uh, he's he's quoting a lot of the the, the, the Old Testament prophets and, and men of God, Abraham and so forth. He's getting his information from the Bible. That's where his sources come from. And the Bible predates him by hundreds of years. The New Testament alone is 600 years ahead of him. Mm -hmm. So it's already in existence. And he's referencing to this, but what he's doing is he's changing everything that that book he's talking about is saying. Now, Steve here could write a book on some subject, and then I could come along you know, a few years later and take his book and then, like, much like uh, 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 Thomas Jefferson did with the Bible, he had a holy Bible. Any verse he didn't like, he just cut it out and came right. up with a truly holy Bible. It put holes in it. <laughs> but anyway, I could take your book and just accept what I feel like accepting and forget the rest. Even though you might still be alive and there be other people that say, yeah, we published this book and we typeset it. And, and you got a ton of witnesses. Mm -hmm. And you got lots of other copies of the book besides this one. And I'm saying, no... Uh, I really believe in what Steve has written, but uh, you know it's been corrupted since he wrote it, and this is really the true way, and I'm quoting from your book all over the place, but then I'm also changing a lot of stuff up. But you're still around. There's still guys that published the book. You see, it just doesn't work historically or factually, and I'm saying the same kind of deal happened here with uh, Muhammad actually quoting the Bible, referencing to the Bible. So he's already set himself up by the standard of the Bible. Right. So he has to be judged by the Bible. He didn't quote some other book. He's quoting the Bible. So he has to be judged by what he's holding up as an authority. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wanting the Muslims out there to understand that. Okay. That they have to go with that, that standard. Otherwise, everything Muhammad's quoting doesn't make any difference if you're going to just throw, it, throw out the, the standard he originally set up. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, uh, you've got one other here. Why is it not enough to revere Jesus as a prophet? Okay, well, Muslims, they would like to, to revere Jesus as a prophet and respect him, uh, but they want to reject his words. And it's like, well, if, if he's a prophet speaking from God, and if God preserved his words, and, and it was a message for all mankind, and they reject his words, they're really not revering him as a prophet. <laughs> I know. Uh, what kind of, well, Jesus said in uh, Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind, of, what kind of prophet is that? Can you see a general of an army? 
he's telling his troops to go do something, and they say, ah, we don't believe you. We, we, we're an army of unbelief. We're not going to we, we, we think you're a general. We think you're great, and blessings and peace be upon you. We'll say that after your name every time we mention your name, general. But as far as anything you tell us, forget it. You know, mm. We feel like doing it. We may do it. But, and that's the way they treat Jesus. They give him, well, blessings and peace be upon him. But when he says things, they, they simply don't believe it. And it reminds and me that it. Yeah. it reminds me of that parable Jesus gave about the two sons. Father asked him, "Well, will you go out and do this?" And one son, "Yes, I will," but then he doesn't go do it. And the other son, he asked him if he'll do it. He said, "No, I'm not." But then he changes his mind, repents, and goes and does it. Jesus asked the question, "Which of the two sons did his father's will?" Mm-hmm. Well, you know, here I see uh, the Muslims giving Jesus all his lip service, but they're not doing what he says. They simply right. don't believe what he says, and it comes down to that. Okay, uh, Christianity. Our next okay. chart. Well, uh, there are a number of, of objections they have just on religion alone. Uh, I've heard uh, objections. Isn't Christianity a foreign religion? Or actually, in some of the new Central Asian republics, they reject Christianity because they say Christianity is a Russian religion. And now all the Christians who are persecuted under the communists would probably, you know, think that kind of strange. But 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 anyway, uh, let let let's let's take this argument. And say, well, what if hypothetically speaking, your ancestors all worshipped idols? And let's say that they had uh, terrible practices, like uh, when a husband died, they would burn uh, the wife would be burned to death with the husband. Let's say they killed infant children. Um, they they did all kinds of things like that. And then let's say somebody in, came and preaching the truth. Would you want to reject uh, the truth because you say, well, they, they didn't uh, you know kill people or, or, or worship idols? No, you want to follow the truth, no matter what, no matter what your culture is. Uh, you want to follow what's true. Okay, and. Uh, People have asked me the question. They said, uh, would, would, "Would you believe? In, would, would you be a Christian if um, if you knew for sure it wasn't true?" And I tell them up front, "No, I wouldn't. Uh, I would follow the truth, no matter what it was." Now I know Christianity is true, uh, and, and or more specifically, and I know what the message of Jesus in the Bible is true. But but I would want to follow the truth, no matter what. Yeah, I mean, it only makes sense. So even Paul said, "Hey, if this this." isn't true and Jesus is not raised from the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, mm. then we have most, all men are most miserable. Yeah. Why, why should we, you know, we should go out and eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Why must we having a good time here instead of doing, you know, suffering all this persecution and, mm-hmm. and taking all this grief from everybody? If this stuff's not true, why worry about it? Let's go live our lives and have a good time. Right. So, I mean, that, you know, that would only make sense. Okay, right. continue with the chart. Uh, uh, all right, two is so related. Well, you know, what if someone says, I don't want to be a Christian because Christianity is not the religion of my parents or my culture. Well, Muslims and Christians and Jews all respect Abraham. Uh, and Abraham, he was originally known as Abram, uh, was from Ur, and his culture uh, was very, very idolatrous and polytheistic. And yet, in this polytheistic culture, uh, God called not a people, but he, he called first a man, uh, Abram, and called him out of that. And Abram believed in God and was credited to him as righteousness. He believed and he came out of that. Uh, and that's what God calls us to do. Whatever our parents, whatever our culture, maybe our culture is, is horrible, maybe our culture is pretty good, maybe our culture is kind of a mixture of both, but whatever, we're not supposed to follow our culture as, as our God. We're supposed to follow God. I've heard people say that, that, that well, you know, I like Jesus, but I really love uh, uh, Islam. And it's like, well, isn't that wrong? It's wrong to love Islam. In, uh, as your highest thing. It's wrong to love Christianity as your highest thing. You should be loving God. Yeah. Now, now, uh, now, I enjoy many things in Christianity, but my loyalty is not to Christianity. My loyalty is to God. Right. And how do you know who God is unless you have a personal relationship with Him That's and, right. you, and you know His Word? Mm-hmm. And we already know what the Bible says about it being you know, 3,800 times just in the Old Testament. This is God's Word. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Jesus is the Word of God. Right. John 1, 1 and so forth. He mm-hmm. is the Word. The Word veiled in flesh. So we have that to know God. Mm-hmm. And uh, you live by that standard, not by just a bunch of man-made traditional structures set up around a religion. Right. Uh, all right, we've kind of answered the third one, but uh, the fourth one, why are there so many Christian sects? Uh, well, in, ta- in talking to Muslims, maybe an analogy can help here. 
Okay, you have some very different uh, groups within Islam, for example. You have some Alawites that believe it's okay to drink alcohol. Uh, you have some other groups that say, well, alcohol is bad, but wine is a different category. Uh, you, you have some that, that have sort of a, a trinity and do worship Muhammad, a very small minority, but you have some. And so you have some, and between the Shiites and, and, and Sunnis, you have uh, differences of succession, are the Hadiths authoritative or not. So within Christianity, uh, you have some major divisions too. Uh, for example, you have the Protestants who, uh, and the, uh, the Protestants who are conservative and hold to the Bible. They say, well, basically we want to get to the source. We want to look at what Jesus and, and what the Bible says. And you have other people who say, well, that's not sufficient. We want the centuries of tradition on top of it uh, that wasn't actually from Jesus. And, and they kind of pick and choose among the tradition because some of that's contradictory with the Catholic Church. And then you have another traditions uh, with the various Orthodox churches and they say they want to do that. So you, so you have people who want to add on to God's Word and they want to add their own stuff uh, and mix things in. Just like within Islam you've had people who want to add on uh, to the message of Muhammad. Okay, it, it, I'm thinking of the Baha'i world religion with Abdul, uh, the, 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 the Bab and, uh, yeah. and, and those guys, they wanted to add on some stuff too. Like right. uh, they, they accepted Muhammad but now you got this other guy it's going to add right. even more stuff. Right. So, so, so the Baha'i religion, for example, does not do anything to prove or disprove Islam. They just add stuff on top of it. Kind, uh, likewise, people who have tried to add things on top of Christianity don't do anything to prove or, or disprove Christianity, except that you know, they're not always acting like Christians. Okay, now another reason is that there are small groups within smaller divisions. For example, within uh, Sunni Islam, you have four major schools. Now these schools, uh, are they differ on interpretation on some matters, temporary marriage and, and a few other things, but generally they, they tend to agree with each other and they accept each other at, at, as valid Muslims. Okay, within Christianity sometimes you have different uh, biblical center Christian denominations and they accept each other as other Christians too. Okay, so, and then you, in both Islam and Christianity throughout history, you've seen a lot of people that it seems like the thing they love first is money or political power, and they maybe use Christianity as a label to try to achieve their own ends. Well, in Islam, you've had some people that uh, have, have basically done the same thing. Right. And if Muslims say, well, you can't point to those people and say, you know, that's what Islam is, they're, you know, you know they might be, be right in that point. And, and just, just so people understand, just like in Islam, a lot of people don't really believe it the way it's written. Christianity is no different. It just ties into what you're saying. Some people take parts that they want and they throw out other parts and they say they call themselves Christians, right. but they really aren't biblical Christians, at least in my in my opinion, because uh, they're not following everything it says. They're just making up their own religion, as I've already said before. Mm -hmm. Whenever you pick and choose little tidbits here and there, and it kind of toss it together in a blender, you come out with blender religion. You just <laughs> come out with whatever uh, recipe you yourself want. Well, that's not authentic Christianity, but that, or Islam. And, and that happens that way, and you Muslims out there realize that. So that's why there's so many Christian sects. They just come up with blender religion, and you get all right. these different sects and things. Okay, we got... Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get through all our charts in this program, brother. We might have to do another program to finish this off, but uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll try. We'll try to go go quickly. Okay, um, we've got the Old Testament explanations. All right, Old Testament explanations. Uh, Muslims have tried to find some prophecy of Muhammad uh, in the Bible, and they think some of them think they found one or a couple of them. In, uh, Deuteronomy 18, 17 to 18, also Deuteronomy 33, 1 through 2, and 34, 10 to 11. Now, the problem with referring to this Muhammad is that uh, God is speaking through Moses and saying, Among me will arise a prophet from your own people. Okay, this is the Israelites here, okay? Not the Arabs, not anybody else, the Israelites. Uh, according to Deuteronomy 18, 17, and 18, who will do many miracles. Deuteronomy 34, 11. Now, this is where, I guess, non-Muslims need to listen closely. Surah 17, 90-93 says, basically, that Muhammad did not do any miracles while alive. Now, they say there's the miracle of the Quran, uh, but other than that, there are no miracles. Now, this is 
contradicted by what we said earlier in the Hadith that have all these miracles of Muhammad. Now you said non-Muslims, so you meant Muslims. Well, 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 I mean, non-Muslims need to listen to this. Why are we saying the Muslim tradition had all these uh, miracles of Muhammad, and yet here it says that Muhammad didn't do any miracles beside the Quran. Right. And it's like, well, yes, this is a contradictory thing, but it's contradictory within you know Islamic tradition. The other thing is is that the priesthood uh, has came through Isaac and Jacob. This is according to Surah 2927. Okay, and then there's some other things I think we can go through pretty quickly because they're actually pretty simple. They're objections to the Bible, but they're pretty simple. Genesis 16, 1, how could Abraham have more children? Remember that, that Sarah was barren? And, 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 and so the, he had Ishmael through Hagar and then Isaac through a miracle through Sarah. Well, how could Abraham have more children later? Uh, you know, the, the, the Midianites and, 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 and other people like that. Well, it wasn't Abraham that was sterile. It was Sarah that was sterile. Uh, number three, uh, was Abraham sex with Hagar uh, sort of like a forced rape, like Muslims are allowed to do in Bukhari, Volume 3, 113 and 432? No, uh, Hagar was actually married to Abraham as a concubine, and she actually boasted about it over Sarah. Okay, so it, it, it was a, a marriage, it wasn't just um, it, you know, a, a, a um, quick hidden thing, um, so it was a different category. And 4 7, how was Isaac Abraham's only son? If Ishmael was born first, okay, uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews all agree that Ishmael was born first. Well, at this particular time in Genesis 22:2, um, it was uh, Ishmael had been sent away, and so Isaac was the only son with Abraham. In nine, where exactly is Mount Sinai? Okay, uh, Christian scholars and many Muslim scholars agree that it was probably a mountain in Sinai called Jebel Musa, which means Mountain of Moses. There is another mountain very close by, though, that could also be a likely candidate, and it's called Ras Es uh, Safe. And uh, Jebel Sirbal, some early Christians thought that, but that's probably not it. Some Muslims say Mecca, but it can't be Mecca because uh, they went from Mount Sinai in a very short period of time to Jerusalem, uh, I mean, to the Promised Land. Um, and you couldn't get there in that period of time uh, from Mecca. Also, they say, well, Mount Sinai was in, I mean, was in Arabia. Well, Arabia was actually a, a Roman province that included the Sinai Peninsula in Roman times, and that's why Paul in Galatians says it's Arabia. In number six, uh, in numbers uh, 31, 17, and 18, why were the Israelites allowed to keep the captive women like they could in Islam? Well, this was actually answered uh, about 1,800 years ago, and I think it's a, a, a pretty good answer, and it was answered by uh, Clement of Rome. And uh, what he said here, uh, this is in his book Stramata, which means miscellaneous, 218. He says, further, it forbids intercourse with a female captive so as to dishonor her. Notice he said forbid, not permit. It says, but allow her, it says, 30 days to mourn according to her wish, and change her clothes, associate with, with her as your lawful wife. And dot, dot, dot. Do you see humanity combined with continents? The master who has fallen in love with his, with his captive maid, it does not allow to gratify his, his pleasure. But he puts a check on his lust by specifying an interval of time, and further it cuts off the captive's hair in order to shame disgraceful love. For it is reason that induces him to marry. He will cleave her even after she has become disfigured. And disfigured just means have, having her hair cut off. So, uh, what, so what, what Clement is trying to say here is that uh, with the captive women, you just can't go in and have sex with them. But if you did fall in love with a captive woman, you are permitted to marry her at, uh, at, at, as a captive. But it's a marriage. It's not just uh, sex with kind of no um, you, you know, responsibilities and no obligations. Like you find in uh, these. Or, uh, in right, not in this temporary marriage stuff. Right. Um, but and 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 and, and uh, another thing about uh, in general about war, sex with captives and 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 women and stuff like that is you have to remember this was under the Old Testament theocracy in the Old Testament times, and Jesus gave us a higher standard. Okay. And 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 and. and we need to follow in the new way of the spirit, not the old way of the written code. But Muslims are still going back to saying, "Well, sex with captives was okay back then, and so it's okay now." You know, well, it, you know, things have changed. Uh, we don't go, we don't go to war. We don't kill people just because they they have another religion. Um, the Christians live harmoniously uh, with idolaters in the Roman Empire, except that the idolaters were killing the Christians, but the Christians were not killing others. Uh, and the Muslims want to go back to, you know, basically go back to before Jesus even came. Okay. Um, Point number seven. 
Okay, so uh, could women inherit in the Old Testament? And this was at least under, misunderstood by one uh, man that I, I talked with, is that yes, women could in, inherit in the Old Testament. And there's no restrictions saying they only get half as much like in Islam or anything like that. But Zalafa had had some daughters and they were allowed to inherit. However, since they inherited the land and the land uh, uh, was a part of the tribe, uh, since the the name was carried through the husband, the women just had the restriction that they had to marry within the tribe, anyone they wanted within the tribe. But they were allowed to inherit the land. And furthermore, uh, it specifically says this isn't just for Zelophehad's daughters, but this is in the future uh, for women who inherit. So women can could inherit in the Old Testament times, and they can inherit now too. All right, and there's no restrictions on that. Okay, so in, in number eight, uh, did David run a protection racket? Well, on one hand, I sure hope he didn't because then both the Quran and the Bible were wrong to honor David. <laughs> All right, but what David did is that uh, he was protecting people's uh, uh, fields and crops uh, from the Philistines and from the Amalekites and from others. And rather than taking a lot of money from the people that he was protecting, he would get spoils of war uh, from, uh, from the Amalekites and others, and he would give the spoils of war to the people that you know, that, that, that he was allegedly uh, running a protection racket against, as uh, some Muslims and some atheists have said. Okay, but, uh, but Muslims in the Quran, and when in the Quran, they accept David as a good prophet of God, just like Christians do. Okay, number nine, what about all of Solomon's wives? Almost implying that or all of Solomon's wives, does that somehow justify Muhammad having all those wives? No, it doesn't at all, because the wife, the Bible clearly explains the situation behind Solomon's wives. Solomon sinned by having so many wives. That's right. And that was an example of uh, they, they led his heart after idols and he was not supposed to, in Deuteronomy it says a king must not have many wives and Solomon broke that and he had the consequences of breaking that. So that was wrong. Exactly. Now uh, we're running rapidly out of time brother so what we'll have to do is finish this in the next episode uh, but what I like to do as we close here is go to this, this final chart entitled Resolution. Could you okay. briefly uh, go through this for our viewers? Yes, uh, uh, there's a very good website, it's not by us, but by somebody else, called www.answering-islam.org.uk uh, that has a lot of problems and contradictions in the Quran and in the Hadith and in Islam. But in addition to those, it has Muslim responses too. So you can kind of see kind of both sides. And it's very thorough and very good. And for more information, including a lot of issues that we did not have time to bring up here in another broadcast, we highly recommend uh, that you visit that site. Okay, what about the next one here? Uh, uh, the next site is done by us. It's www.inerrancy.org. And it has answers for over 7,000 questions of the Bible. Bible, uh, including the, the questions we have here. And the questions, uh, it doesn't primarily relate to Islam, but if Muslims do say something about Bible verses, then it does address that. And addresses a lot of things that uh, skeptics, atheists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and even a lot of genuine Christians, just questions that they might ask. Okay, and then finally it says, if the Bible stands, then Islam falls. Consider the words of the prophet Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, John 14:6. You must make a decision for Jesus. And with that, brother, uh, we have to conclude our program. We're out of time. I'm Larry Wessels of Christian Answers with my associate, Steve Morrison of Christian Answers. He's the director of our research here. Uh, if anyone wants a free newsletter, a resource list, uh, or tracks or other information on Islam, please call or write. We'll send these things to you free. Thank you for being with us. Join us again next time. God bless you all. What is Jesus' gospel which he entrusted to his apostles? The answer can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-8, through 8, which states, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance that I also receive that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas then to the twelve after that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time most of whom remain until now but some have fallen asleep then he appeared to James then to all the apostles and last of all 
as it were to one untimely born, he, he appeared to me also. All of this is attested to by Jesus' own disciples, eyewitnesses, and apostles, along with manuscript and early church history. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 